After reflecting on the last five decades, I've come to realize that I have a story, one of my music and my sound, and the marvelous collaborations with friends and colleagues. With a little help from these friends, I will share with you the journey that has shaped my musical life. I suppose every musician has a story, and my story is not new, but it is mine. Welcome to The Path Taken, hosted by Tom Farley and Alton Riddick. First it's one, then five, ten, twenty, etc. There seems to be something special about those familiar and easily divisible numbers that we hold so dear. It seems that anything remembered in these chronological increments is in the extremes. You know, times in our lives. Well, the calm before the storm is one of those. Good now, good then. For those in its orbit, for this 30th anniversary, very divisible and even more familiar. Hello, y'all. This is Alton Reddick with Tom Farley, another episode of, uh, from The Path Taken. Hey, everybody. And uh, we're going to talk about a particular CD today. And um, I definitely have some words to say that is due because he's been hiding stuff. He's been <laughs> hiding stuff. He's been hiding stuff from us all, and I think he's got a problem. It's definitely a failure to communicate because there are some gems on this record that don't get mentioned day to day that should. But that'll come later. But I just want to give you an introduction to this record. It's a great record. I listened to it three or four times in the last week or so just to get prepared for this. And I'm telling you, it's good. I'm not saying it's, it's, it's his best because all of his stuff is his best at the time. But for me, there are some nice moments in here, more than a few. And um, we're going to talk about that later. We're going to talk about who played on this. We're going to talk about what, you know, what equipment was used. Um, frame of mind. A lot of questions I have personally were inspiration oriented. So we're going to just, um, you know, sit down and get talking about all of it. So that was my introduction. Um, obviously, Tom is on. So uh, the first question is, it says on Spotify, this was 2008. So was this actually 2008? No, uh, this album was uh, actually created and uh, was released in 1991. That's what I thought. Because, see, now the biggest question is at this point at the start is the 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 cover art. I shouldn't say art. It's a photo. So it's, a, it's the cover photo. And I think that that is a cute story of how that happened. I think it's a really cool story because of where you were and everything that was going on. So why don't you tell us about that? Well, uh, the picture is of the Peter Paul Fortress uh, in uh, St. Petersburg, which at the time we were there was Leningrad. We went there in 1990, and uh, Tanya took the picture on her phone, uh, not on her fire phone, uh, her small little, 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 I guess you could say, uh, digital camera. And we brought it back. Uh, I basically took it off of there and tried and worked with it to get it to, to look good, um, there is one song, Leningrad, on the album that uh, was inspired by that trip. But, you know, eventually the calm before the storm was uh, was decided on, uh, as, as being the, the actual name of the album. And that picture just seemed to fit. So she was happy with it. So was I. So it stuck. And so that we use that picture for the, the album cover. OK, that's a great picture because, you know, there's a there is a. A storm coming in that day, right? Oh, yeah, it, that was, it was it was a hell of a storm. As a matter of fact, once it finally arrived. OK. So now, now that you, you know, we're kind of setting you up for, you know, telling the story of a record because every record's got a story. Yeah, it does. And I felt like I really wanted to get started with, you know, the picture because there's a story behind it. So now that we know that, I don't want to get into the nuts and bolts of it right away. Okay. But for me, um, where were your, where was your headspace when you're writing this? And I'm presuming that you're writing this all at one time. Is that the case? And if it was the case, where was your head? Well, uh, to tell you the truth, um, a lot of the songs were were done before 1990 uh, when we actually started, you know, planning on going into the studio. Uh, we were in the studio in 1990 into 1991. Um, there were some songs that were done much earlier, uh, like um, Old and Familiar Play uh, and Fresh Air uh, were songs that were done with Jim Michaels at uh, Live Oak uh, many years back uh, with with Tom Jones, 
And uh, they were just kind of sitting there on two inch tape. And uh, eventually I went to Steve Pepys's studio over at his house and we did those two songs. Uh, we did a, a, you know, a one time only hope we get it right mix on that because basically the tapes were flaking or they were that old and uh, they turned out to be really, really good. So those songs, two songs were actually there quite some time before. Um, the Baby Can I Hold You was a, uh, and The Landslide were, were songs that were standards for Tanya and the act, so they've been around for a while. Professional Back Roads Man had been around for quite some time. Um, yeah, there, it, it's not a, like it all kind of came to, uh, it was written at the same time. Uh, they, there were definitely uh, different periods of time where these songs uh, popped up. Uh, an old and familiar play is really quite an old song. Uh, but basically, um, it, it, I, I resurrected that because I needed something that was a little autobiographical. Uh, so uh, the songs uh, that, that eventually ended up on the album uh, all had a specific kind of meaning or, or engineering interest to them. But uh, at the end of the day, it was a collective over probably about 10 years worth of songwriting since the last album. Okay, I get that. Okay, because my question was, as I was listening to it, was, you know, when you're writing these songs, because the end product I'm listening to is the performances are amazing. That's for sure. And then, you know, I'm thinking to myself, it's like, are, did he write all of these at once and then rehearse them? Or did he write them and they worked them up just doing them live every week? I didn't really know and I wanted to know. So that's, that, that's, you know, actually pretty good because I was thinking that some of them were older, but I wasn't really sure. And I was like, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. So, okay, well, go, go ahead what you're going to say. Um, the, the great thing about this album is that uh, Tanya and Jerry and I, even though there were other people that did cameos on the album, Tanya and Jerry and I did perform this uh, every weekend uh, before we went into the studio, hammering out the little different parts and the arrangements and uh, Jerry getting his, uh, his lead parts down the way that he wanted. So when we walked into the studio at Earworks with Bob, uh, we would have everything pretty much squared away. Uh, there would be some 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 moments with Bob where we improvise and stuff like that, but the basic arrangement of the songs and uh, the uh, collaborative stuff with the uh, other people that were going to be coming in and doing work, like Donnie Satterwhite and B.J. Lederman and so forth, Mike Munden, uh, those things uh, were already hammered out. Uh, it also gave us time, since we were performing, uh, it gave us time to actually sift through the songs that we really wanted to put on the album. There were some songs that... Uh, we really didn't perform all that much live, but we're really kind of close to our hearts. We wanted to, uh, to make sure we get in there like you don't have to. Uh, Donnie, did, Donnie Satterwhite was playing pedal steel on that, and he didn't sit in with us all that often because he, he had his own band and his own gigs. So at the end of the day, uh, there were some songs that weren't performed all that much, but really needed to be part of the, uh, of the you know collection of songs for the album. So, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we really had a, a really good chance to, to hammer out all the stuff we needed to in order to be able to have a great studio experience once we finally went to Earworks. Okay, okay. Well, that takes care of the song selection. Um, well, before we move on from that, was there some songs on there that didn't make it? Well, I mean, there, there were some uh, some songs, I guess you could say, from earlier periods, uh, stuff like we uh, covers especially, uh, like stuff that we used to do with uh, with Cam or things that we used to do with with Vernon uh, that, you know, were good songs. We had them down pat, but they didn't really fit the overall uh, atmosphere and skill sets of the group that we were working with, with me, Tanya and Jerry. Uh, plus, uh, at, at the end of the day, uh, uh, we were really happy with the collection of songs that we had here. Uh, it was nice to be able to uh, have a blend of rock and country and acoustic and all the rest of that kind of stuff. And also we wanted to make sure uh, that the vocal harmonies and stuff like that had a consistency to them uh, to where it really allowed us to show our capabilities, you know, on the vocal end. So um, uh, there was, there, there were songs that were not added to the album, but I mean, there's a ton of songs on there. So we, I think we actually did a good service to making sure that people got their money's worth. Okay. Well, now we can kind of kind of get into some of the nuts and bolts, some of it, you know, because when I'm hearing it, and like you said, you kind of give me a, a point of reference um, history-wise on when it was done, which when I think about it from that point of view, 
And I was old enough to understand what the Insonic EPS was on mm-hmm. many levels, not only just from a programming standpoint, but from a hip hop standpoint and, and beat making. All that machine was a lot of things to a lot of people. Oh yeah. So I know that there was a there was a big upheaval, and you ended up using this to take up the slack, and it actually turned out to work pretty well. So tell us the story on the you know on how this particular instrument helped you progress? Well, um, my first exposure to the Insonic EPS was with Steve Gallagher over at his studio um, over near uh, Nemo Church. Uh, it was in his house, and he uh, what he used it mostly for sampling and for working out basic sequences for himself. Uh, I wanted to, I, I saw the potential of the EPS to, to actually program a group, to program songs uh, that we could actually play along to. And by programming the songs, I mean programming the drums, each individual uh, part of the drums, you know, snare, kick, you know, tom-tom, cymbals, hi-hats, all of us, that stuff, and the bass, give us a rhythm section to work with. And then we could put our, our guitars, our, our voices, uh, and Tanya could put her keyboard parts, you know, right on there on top of it. And we could all we could engineer it uh, since they had a, a special, I guess you could say, uh, it was a, a special output that you could plug into the to the keyboard that allows you to take all eight channels that you that you could program with and give them an individual, you know, output. So I could run like like a snare would go to a snare channel on the board and so forth all the way down the line. Every single instrument, all the voices and stuff had their own channels, so we could do EQs and and reverb and stuff like that uh, to make a really really good live sound. The only problem which we discussed uh, was the fact that, you know, once they're programmed, they have to be played every single time the same way. I mean, there were some songs that were cover tunes like It Doesn't Matter or uh, something like, um, uh, let me see, uh, All Along the Watchtower, what I could that I could program and put in really long, nice instrumental parts so Jerry would have a chance to jam and we could actually, you know, make a, an interesting song out of it, uh, you know, just from a jam point of view. But uh, on the other side, when you're looking at all the all the other songs that were going to be part of the album, they had to be a specific length. Now that was looked like a really you know it might be problematic at first, but when we, when we got out and performed it, what was really great about it is once the album was actually in the can, we were able to give an album perfect performance every single night. I mean, they wanted to come in. They want to hear the songs of the album. That's exactly what they got. Every single part, exactly the way it was recorded. Vo- vocals live, and also, uh, you know, at, through a PA, it, it really sounds really. It really sounded great, to tell you the truth. So we had that, and, and, and in order to be able to give a little bit of, I guess you could say, freedom to us to do whatever the hell we wanted to do, we started off our our uh, sets. Our, our evening with an acoustic set, about 45 minutes of me and Tanya and Jerry, two acoustic guitars and three vocals doing our acoustic thing. And that kind of gave us a little freedom to uh, to play around with the songs that we couldn't do with the keyboard. But once the keyboard kicked in, I mean, the whole evening was, uh, was a live and in-color album, which was actually quite an advantage. I think people enjoyed that. Okay. Now, did that make you feel constricted as an artist or... Did it matter because your show was balanced with, you know, the 45 minutes of acoustic and then you went into that? So how did you feel about that? Well, the neat thing is, is that things like tom-toms and and kick drums and snares and stuff like that, uh, when you program them, you can program them to have have strong moments and, and weaker moments to give it more of a live feel. Once you put that through a PA and get get the right EQ on it and get the right, uh, you know, reverb for specific instruments, uh, and it also allow a couple of uh, channels on the keyboard for Tanya to play her strings or her piano or whatever the case might be. You offer up a, a tremendous amount of, um, well, let's just say uh, it, it really kind of edges toward the perfection. Uh, the thing is, is that to me, uh, performing is, is a lot of fun. And you would think, well, you're playing along to a keyboard. No, I was playing along to a rhythm section. And I had two other people on stage with me, and the three of us sounded like we were an eight-piece band. And that was formidable. Back in those those days, it was very, very difficult to get a, a, a six- or eight-piece band on the stages that were provided by the clubs that were actually hiring live music. We were able to get a really gigantic sound from three people on stage, and and, and the, the rest of the 
people, so to speak, which was the keyboard, sounded absolutely awesome. It kicked through really, really well. So uh, there, there might have been some kind of, uh, I guess you could say, difference to it, but I liked the difference. And we were, you know, it was also great to know that every single cue, every single spot where things were supposed to come in were, was in the exact same place every single time. Nobody screwed up because the keyboard doesn't screw up. I, so at the end of the day, uh, it, it actually worked out to be a great performance situation for us. It wasn't boring at all. Sweet. Okay. I was wondering because some musicians don't feel that way. Sequence well, parts, especially if you're not in the uh, pop genre, um, sequence parts can feel constricting. I mean, personally, I, I like to do what you, you guys were doing. I want to be consistent enough to be the same every night. Well, so. to me, I, I think that you owe that to your audience. I mean, some groups, uh, you know, they come in, um, uh, their, their performances are good, but they're, they're very inconsistent. And if someone happens to want to go off on a, on a tangent somewhere and you're not aware of it, then that changes the entire composition of the song and, and sometimes can go down roads that you know, are not really avenues you want to pursue. Uh, with this, uh, you know, we were able to uh, deliver that kind of performance. And, you know, for me, it's all about, you know, giving it right to the crowd, uh, pleasing the crowd. They come out, they spend their time, they spend their money. They want to hear the songs. You know, they want to hear an album version, you know, but they want to hear it live. And we were able to give them that. And I think that was a real big plus uh, for us. And it gave me a tremendous amount of satisfaction knowing that every single time we stepped up and Tanya would push the keyboard, would actually, you know, load the song in, push the start button. We were there. I mean, every single time. And I even had a, uh, uh, back in the day, they didn't have like UPS uh, electric, you know, uh, backup things but i i they, the first one that they ever put out i made sure i had for that keyboard to make sure that there was a steady amount of, of of good power going to it and if the power happened to go off then the keyboard wouldn't get screwed and you know we could shut it off that that kind of thing in other words i made sure the keyboard was was well maintained and, and as safe as possible as far as a live performance is concerned okay and that's good thinking because i probably wouldn't have thought of that <laughs> i'm letting you know now i'm irresponsible that way so I you appreciate are, people you? like you. Because <laughs> if the power goes out, we're screwed. It was my band. I promise you that. I hear you. <laughs> okay. So we've gotten all the preliminary stuff out of the way. We understand, you know, how the music came to be. Some of it was old. Some of it was new. You know, we understand, you know, how you picked them and, you know, kind of the early – origins of it as far as the new for the new stuff you know how things were written even the, some of the old stuff how it was re-recorded to make sure it was it was good enough and it was good enough so now we're at the part where you get to tell us about earworks and bob smith because that seems to be kind of the the linchpin to, to what we hear on spotify or apple music or wherever you're hearing this so tell us about earworks and tell us about bob smith well bob um I met Bob fresh. I mean, I was, I, someone said, you need to go over and talk to Bob Smith at Earworks and see if that will work out for you. There were a few studios around, uh, you know, some of them had, had been around longer than Earworks, but I, I also went uh, and saw the bands and stuff that Bob was working with. He was working with mostly rock bands, not so much acoustic stuff, but he did have an ear for acoustic guitar. So we went over and talked with him and it didn't take 10, 15 minutes. I knew this was a guy. He was, he was uh, amiable. He was knowledgeable. He knew what he was doing. He had great suggestions. Um, he also, one of the great things about working with an engineer in the studio, he knows basically what will work and what will not. I made suggestions. Why don't we try this? He said, well, you know, you could, but it's really not going to blend in all that well. Why don't we go down this road? And he was right every single time. So I trusted in his, uh, his ability to actually take a look at our talent, our skill sets, and, uh, you know, take the songs that we are, had already, you know, programmed. He did the keyboard stuff first, and then we put all the other stuff on top of it. But at the end of the day, uh, he was a man that was, that was really, really in tune with what we were doing, uh, with what we were all about. And also, we were the first group he had ever recorded that had that basic keyboard, you know, rhythm section foundation thing going on. And so that was a challenge for him. But I think he did a great job. Uh, and, you know, he was the second uh, professional studio we were in. We went to Quadraphonic in Nashville for the mix there. 
uh, even though we recorded here at Live Oak, uh, we did everything with Bob. We record the tracks there, and we mix it down with Bob. We sent it away to be mastered, but uh, but all the work, the the heavy lifting, was done right there with Bob at Earworks. And he, you know, to this day is a good buddy. Uh, we still love collaborating on music stuff and you know just basic uh, you know, friendship stuff. Uh, we don't get a chance to see each other because we're all really pretty busy all the time. But um, it's always great when we have a chance to get together. And he's he's a he's an excellent talent. Always has been. Okay. So re-engineering the program tracks. I mean, tell us about that because some some you know keyboard even now some keyboard sounds sound like keyboard sounds. So how did y'all? What was Bob's approach or your approach or whoever's approach it was? How was the approach to kind of get that to blend from a you know a mix standpoint? Because I mean they're stereo they're stereo files so they're already recorded. So how did y'all go about doing that? Well, we started off recording. We didn't start at Earworks. We started off with Ira White. Uh, he had a studio called Mirror Studios. Okay. Uh, and uh, we put the basic rhythm tracks down there. And also we did uh, the acoustic guitar track uh, and the violin track for uh, Landslide there. Well, they took really, really well, and we could use them. But when we when we took the the two-inch tapes into Bob, uh, for some reason, um, you know, when back in the day when you had to use, uh, uh, when you're doing... Um, non-digital, like I said, analog recording, you set tones on a tape. And the tones, uh, you know, need to match up as far as frequency, and also they need to match up in terms of how they line up with your tape head. But we had some serious issues with how the rhythm tracks actually lined up uh, at, from Mirror Studio into Bob. So we just basically said, screw it, we're going to redo all the rhythm tracks, you know, at Bob's, uh, and that way it'll all be pristine. Uh, the landslide... Uh, was uh, just an acoustic song. It didn't have any rhythm or anything like it. Just an acoustic guitar had Mike Munden on violin and Tanya on vocals. So that was that was pretty straightforward. But all the other tracks that that had actual uh, EPS uh, programming on them uh, had to be redone and re-recorded at Bob's. But it's just a matter of running it through and getting all the tracks, um, you know, on on their separate channels so we could actually get started. And, and Bob did that well, and uh, he worked. Uh, even outside the time that he was with us to make sure that uh, he could get the actual things like the kick drum and the toms and stuff like that uh, to sounding as as smooth and as unmechanical, so to speak, because things are not like they are now with the studio loops and things of that nature. Um, you, you took a, a particular voice or sound like a kick drum or whatever, and you program that. And sometimes uh, even though you would try to to blend it in through the programming process, sometimes it could sound just a little mechanical, but we were able to throw all the vo vocals, all the guitars, the keyboards, and any other extra artists we had on top of it. So it really didn't it really didn't uh, overpower uh, in any one of the songs uh, in terms of you know sounding weird. It sounded just like it was supposed to. Okay. The other thing I noticed. Um... As I'm listening, the guitar tones were really good. I mean, the electric guitar tones are really good. Obviously, your stuff was great, but um, who chose who chose that? Is that Bob? Is that you? Is that is that Eddie? Who who's choosing the uh, the amps and the tones and dialing in the tones for that? Well, um, Bob had a. Um, I'm trying to remember uh, that. I want to say Music Man, but it's not Music Man. Um, uh, had a, an amplifier there uh, in, in the studio. He had several amplifiers. Jerry brought in his amplifier, uh, but uh, I think he ended up uh, playing through a Fender Twin, playing his uh, uh, Les Paul through a Fender Twin. Uh, me, I use uh, the um, uh, the stack in order to be able to do the slide guitar for uh, for Leningrad, and um, you know I really enjoyed that. Uh, so basically. It's not just the 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 amps that you're going to use, but what mic you're going to use to actually uh, do the amps. Okay. So at the at the end of the day, um, we were we went in and did spent about two or three hours with both Jerry and me on the electric side, trying to figure out just exactly what mics and what amps we wanted to use. And it, it, it Bob was very well, he was he had done a lot of rock bands, so he had some pretty good experience in terms of suggestion. Uh, so at the end of the day, it didn't take us hardly any time at all. Uh, to to figure out the amps that, that we were going to use and then just go ahead and move on it. Was it the Mesa Boogie you're talking about? Yes, thank you very <laughs> Yeah, it was a Mesa Boogie uh, stack. It was like, you know, a head with this huge, gigantic, uh, you know, 412 uh, cabinet to it. I'm familiar. And they sound, especially when they're overdriven, they sound great. 
Oh yeah, I mean, and, and you know, for me, uh, I I I had uh, my own Strat, which Tanya had bought me, and of course, I played uh, the the slide lead for Leningrad so many times uh, to make sure I got it down pat. But I, I didn't have an amplifier like that. I mean, you go in there with, with that kind of amplifier, and the sensitivity is because it's so loud. Uh, the sensitivity is just amazing. I had I had to uh, do a little bit of adjustment, but the, it was fun adjusting because. You know, the amp was so powerful. Just let the amp do the work, and it, it came out great. You know, I was really pleased with the way that that uh, slide guitar part worked. It really did. I, I promise you, it did. I, I really enjoyed listening to all the guitar work on that. So, going from guitar to vocals, you s- experimented with the vocals. What was the experimentation? Well, uh, the the three part harmony that Jerry and Tanya and I had, we really didn't have to experiment with. Uh, we we did that uh, pretty much on our own. However, uh, Leningrad, which was a song that uh, basically I did all the parts myself. Uh, so uh, I-, I was looking for some some kind of background harmony, oohs and ahs, that kind of thing. And Bob made the suggestion, uh, why don't you put an ah part in here when you're on the on the chorus? Uh, and we chose kind of like a Beatles style harmony uh, for that, which I really, I really, really uh, enjoy putting together. We put together the three parts for that. And uh, it ended up being great. Uh, that suggestion by Bob was one of many that he gave, which worked out to be perfect in terms of uh, the overall you know, feel of the song. So there were moments like that all the way through. Um, for example, like uh, on Missing My Old Man, uh, the, the, the vocal was, was pretty straightforward. But what happened was I really wanted to have a fuller acoustic guitar sound. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want him to actually record my acoustic guitar on two separate tracks. So what we did was I played it all the way through. Uh, same thing with uh, Landslide. I played it all the way through um, uh, one time. And then we set up another track, and I, I copied it lick for lick, note for note on the finger picking, all the way through again. And even it, it, the possible differences between the two tracks are so subtle that um, – you know, that you really can't tell. I mean, that's one of the things that I, I do well is I, I can actually finger pick and then go over and, and, and play a second part to it, and it would be absolutely note-on-note note perfect. That's I, I like that part of recording. So, I mean, so Bob and I work with that in order to be able to get a fuller blend as far as the acoustic guitars are concerned. So vocal-wise, uh, the background harmonies, um, I guess you could say, are uh, are, the, are the thing that uh, were the the – at the moment, spur of the moment, uh, suggestions by Bob that actually worked out really well. Okay. Now, I'm familiar with some of the sounds. I remember going into, you know, if you're from here and listening to this, uh, A&M was one of the uh, music stores around here. And that was always fun for me. I never had a lot of money, but I would just go in there and hang out and, and bother those guys for free, <laughs> which they did not appreciate, I'm sure. <laughs> but I think either Jeff or Kermit um, gave me a uh, a demo of the Insonic EPS, and is the first time I heard samples like crowd noise and clapping and all the sorts of things we take for granted in real life in digital form. And so when I listened to um, Slow Drivers in the in the in the uh, in the left hand lane. Mm-hmm. And and you you know I'm like I wanted to ask you if you got those sounds from that I wasn't really sure but now it makes sense but take us through the decision to put that in the composition in the mix as a part of the song because it does really does it does especially on slow drivers it really does set up the tone for yeah, the song. It does. I understand. I've always been a real big uh, guy with uh, uh, sound effects. Uh, like I sent you that that copy of Alone had the the birds chirping in the background exactly. you know, during the that was that was the first major uh, yeah, I guess you could say home recording I ever did, and it, that kind of thing stuck with me ever since. Um, as far as slow drivers, Bob had a, an excellent sound effects library on okay. CD, and so we went through. I, I knew what I wanted, uh, and he we we he chose about. I said. You know, can you pick out some for me? Because you, you know, you had to go through a catalog, a whole thing to, to find those particular car sounds. And so he he picked out two. I mean, he picked he picked out about fifteen or twenty, but we chose two. 
Uh, one was just the, you know, uh, the sound of the actual engine, then the one taking off, you know, like it's pulling out of a of a rocky road onto a highway kind of thing. Right. Uh, that was, you know, that was, I love that. I mean, it's the same thing as the promenade blues, having the sound of the waves coming in. Uh, you know, there's something about adding a little bit of, um, uh, of sound effects like Donnie, Donnie Sadowai created the storm effects for Jody Lee Carroll on the first album. Right. So uh, that's always been a, a real fun thing to get into. And Bob, of course he had, he had the, the, the source for all the, the, the sound effects that I needed. So we, we just had fun with that. Okay. It's, it's really fitting and apropos. I, like I said, I, I didn't know if you got it uh, from the, the Insonic library or not, but I'm glad somebody made a decision to put that in there. It really sets the tone for the song. So, you know, we already talked about, you know, kind of the recording process and recording the vocals. Is there anything that you want to say about anything, any other stuff that you do in a studio? Overdubs, um, fixing little things here and there? Well, I mean... Uh... Going into the studio with with a a really nice set arrangement in mind and knowing exactly what you want to do and how we're going to sing it, it, it all boils down to uh, how well it can be recorded. Bob chose the right mics to record our voices. And, you know, one mic does not fit all. No. You and I both know that. Yes. Bob was smart about that, and he was able to pick the mics that actually recorded our voices because my voice, Tanya, and Jerry's voice is a are really quite different, but they blend together nicely if you can throw it through a PA or put it on tape and actually work with it the way that um, that would allow for, for the best possible result. Bob knew that. Uh, he had that experience with vocals. Most of them were, were screaming rock vocals because he loved to do, you know, uh, just off-the-chart rock bands. Uh, but the thing is, he also knew uh, through that experience, even though they might be a little louder and prouder, uh, he also knew uh, exactly what mic uh, uh, would would be the best one for each one of our, vo- our vocals. And we had very high-end, sensitive mics, mics that uh, most people would shy away from because, well, to tell you the truth, it, it, it picks up the sound of the air going past your nose hairs. It's so damn, uh, you know, sensitive. Right. And, and you have to change the way that you actually sing to a certain extent in order to be able to allow for, I guess you could say, not as many S's and 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 Explosive moments, so to speak, like I just did right there. <laughs> uh, th- those kinds of things, and um, uh, so because they didn't, you, you had to get it when you sing. You had to get there was no taking it back and let me run it through a, a filter or some kind of plug-in. There wasn't any of that going on, so you had to get it right the first time, which is you know that's the discipline that we had, had our entire performing lives. So it was just a matter of making sure first of all we had the right microphones, which Bob did. And then when we mixed those vocals down, uh, it, it, you know, it was wonderful. Just the right amount of effects, uh, you know, a really nice blend as far as how they're panned. Uh, we got into it in a big way, and, and it came out great. Well, so we've covered the beginnings, you know, a lot of the, tr- the trivial things that matter, if you can even say that in the same sentence. But they do matter. The whole journey leading up to the record itself. So... Let's just go through this this CD one song at a time. Okay. <laughs> now I have I have my notes. I was taking notes. I, well, I can't say I was taking notes in the car, but I went through this song by song to make sure everything I thought about it was written down. So to ask you about it because there's nothing like the horse's mouth. So the first song, "Calm Before the Storm." You kind of caught me out there with this one because I had a thought about what it was going to be. And it wasn't that. In fact, it was so sad. It is a sad song. And it's like, where did you get the inspiration for that? Well, I got it from um, uh, two things. Uh, first of all, uh, Lloyd Stone, who was uh, our my still my good buddy and uh, was our light man for many years. Uh, Lloyd was in the Navy at the time. He was a chief, and they his ship went over to Desert Storm. Okay. And he had family and loved ones here uh, that he was leaving. Um, I could see it in his face the last time that we uh, we saw him off at the dock, uh, just like we met him at the dock when you know, when he came back. Uh, it was a sad time to see him go. Uh, and, you know, you never want to see, even though they're on a ship and it's pretty safe, I guess you could say, in modern times, you, you, you never can tell what would happen in a war footing in terms of, you know, uh, uh, military personnel. 
So I was thinking about Lloyd and the people he was leaving. That was one thing. But also, uh, I at that particular time, um, not too many people had a, a really positive outlook uh, for women in the military. Right. Uh, it was still a highly debated uh, issue. And the first verse uh, uh, says, knowing there's a reason for her going off to war. Uh, I really wanted to make a statement about uh, women in the military to let them know that basically, uh, you know, you see guys waving goodbye to their wives and girlfriends and stuff like that. There are women on those ships that are waving goodbye to their husbands and their brothers and their fathers and and their boyfriends. Uh, that are those kinds of relationships are just as meaningful, and and uh, those moments uh, of goodbye are just as I guess you could say emotional and sometimes sad. And I wanted to make sure that I included that in, in the process of, 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 of the, uh, you know, writing the vocal, uh, the lyrics. So, um, so I did. Well, that was, a, that was, a, that was a tearjerker. Um, and like I said before, I think I took the, I, I don't know what I expected. I just didn't expect what I, what I heard. And it's, it's a great tune. It's a great tune. Well, I mean, uh, the thing is, is that, um, I, I I still, you know, when I sit around and practice my acoustic finger picking, that's one that I like to practice because um, I play along, you know, with the recording for two reasons. First of all, uh, Mike Munden's uh, violin solo is so poignant. I mean, that man just, just grabbed that song and just made it happen. I mean, you know, he brought out all the emotional energy uh, that the song was trying to get there, get, get across to the audience and just made it happen. And of course, Stevie had... Uh, had his strings, you know, low in the background, but they had moments when they actually rose, uh, especially in the end, end part of the instrumental that trails out the song. Uh, so that was, you know, a really, really nice, uh, I guess you could say, combination of instruments. And the people who played on that were just absolutely stunning. Uh, I just really, you know, it, 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 it needed to be the first song, even though it's, it's not, I guess you could say, an up-tempo thing, which a lot of people lead an album off with. It, it brings uh, an emotional quality uh i guess you could say to the to the album which you know uh you go from that to kinky with my baby at the end of the day that you have a broad swath of 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 you know of emotion and humor and, and rock and roll but I, I wanted i wanted that to be the opening statement because it meant so much just i i thought especially coming from a military area to so many people Are torn. 
the sand within their hourglass falls on a distant shore just waiting out the calm before the storm Well, you 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 really, as far as I'm concerned, you expressed what you wanted to express. That that one was a good one. So now the next one is um, Leningrad. Um, so obviously you were inspired to write that one because you were in Russia at the time. Oh yeah, absolutely. But my first uh, question was, is that you? Is that you on slide? That's me on slide. Yeah, and I I knew you could play it, but I didn't know you could play it. Well, I didn't know I could play it either. <laughs> I mean, I, I I practiced that because I am not an electric guitar player. I'm certainly not an electric slide player. But the part was exactly what I wanted. I wanted it simple, and I wanted it out there, and I wanted it strong. Uh, you know, but uh, as far as, and of course, that uh, Mesa Boogie stack did all the work for me. It was just a matter of keeping it under control, and it, it allowed me to have that sustain thing at the end of each slide thing, which I really, really wanted. And the amp was powerful enough to give that to me. I mean, mm-hmm. I had to learn how to lean into the speaker a little bit to, to make sure that it picked it up, but didn't, you know, didn't go too far off the charts in terms of, you know, going crazy as far as feedback was concerned. Little things like that, which uh, uh, which made the recording of that so much fun for me because it was a first, but it worked out great. Okay, that that I think that's I don't know the songs the songs really good. Don't get me wrong, but. That slide jumped out at me, and I was like, I, you know, I'm not really sure who did it. 
I have to ask him, but that was definitely um, a highlight for me in that that particular song. It was good. It, it was a little, it was a little dark because you know Russia's dark. It's not a you know. I'm sure it's a beautiful place if you grow up there. I think if you don't grow up there, it has a, it, it it you know it doesn't have a lot of light as far as day to day life and you know just kind of the vibe. I think you caught that in all of your lyrics, but I got to ask you. Since you have actually been over there, is it true to what we kind of think of Russia? Well, uh, culturally, uh, it's magnificent. Uh, the architecture, uh, the music, and stuff like that are, are, are really something. When we went over there in 1990, uh, they were just getting, you know, perestroika and breaking down the wall and all the rest of that stuff was was just, you know, coming to a, a head, so to speak. And uh, so... When we got to, to Leningrad or St. Petersburg, um, it was a lot different from Moscow, but both of those places had one thing in common. There was a, there was, I can't say a sadness, but there was a, uh, there was a, an atmosphere of not hopelessness, but just, well, let's put it this way. Uh, stories about Russians drinking a lot of vodka, that shit's true. They do. They drink a lot of vodka. Okay. Uh, and they do that because there's a certain, you know, a certain something about living during that particular time, which was, what, 30, over 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, that was part of their existence. Uh, luckily, Tanya and I were able, uh, we're still friends with uh, Vladimir Timovir. He's a drummer up in Canada. Uh, he defected uh, shortly after we had a chance with him. We left uh, illegally. The hotel and went back to his place in uh, Potemkin, um, and and stayed at his apartment. Uh, listened to his music, had all night conversations, stayed up all night, that kind of thing. And uh, I saw exactly how poor they were. He he was living. He was a drummer at the club uh, that the, in the hotel where we were staying, and his band was great. And we, we we talked to him then, and then he offered to take us, you know, uh, to his place. And um, so. At the end of the day, uh, there's there's a lot of there wasn't sorrow or or sadness. It's just a state of being that that was not as positive. Uh, and of course, with uh, with everything changing, with the coming down of the wall and all the rest of that stuff, uh, people were in a, a state of flux. They really didn't know how it was all going to work out, whether it would be violent or whether or not they would be able to uh, to really you know see some kind of positive change. So uh, the the places that we went and the and the sites that we saw. Uh, were, were wonderful, um, but the, the people themselves, who I loved, uh, were, were exceptional. They, they were friendly, and uh, and they were full of good conversation. One interesting thing, though, that they didn't have a lot of, you go to the, the, the markets and stuff like that, and clothing was at a real, uh, you know, it was rare. And you would see people when they, when they would come out to the clubs at night, the outfits that they would put together were things that were, that were kind of piecemeal. It's not like, oh, you go in and you buy an entire outfit and everything matches and stuff like that. It wasn't like that at all. It's like, you know, you buy what you could what you could find. It was like, you know, the people still had a hard time finding toilet paper and all the rest of that kind of stuff. Okay. So, you know, it 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 made for made you really appreciate uh living in a country that had uh the bounty that the United States did, but it also made you respect them for the incredible amount of adaptation that they did to their situation so wow that must have been a, a a whole lot of experience right there that's i mean like i said before you can you can pretend like you know but you don't know until you're there well so. you're absolutely right I, I mean when we walked through red square there were still army guys with ak-47s at, at every turn and they're intimidating as hell i mean you walk up to somebody who knows that you're an american is holding a, a high-powered rifle in a military uniform, looking at you like, you know, it wasn't like Nazi Germany or anything, but, you know, when you see something like that all around you, um, then, I mean, even going through customs at the airport was was an interesting, rather, you know, uh, serious, you know, experience. So, uh, you know, it, it was an education, but, you know, uh, we had uh, uh, parents and kids there uh, on the field trip, so it, it, was, it was a learning experience for all of us. Okay. Well, everybody's favorite, slow drivers in the left-hand lane. First of all, <laughs> I want to thank you for expressing the anger of many people. 
Yeah, man, me too. God, <laughs> I hate I hate that. It still gets me, you know? But I mean, and I have to admit, I've been that person too. I have. It's just like you're not paying attention. You look up in the rearview mirror and there's a mile of traffic behind you because you won't get out of the way. I've been that guy. I'm sorry. Um, well, the first thing I noticed was it kind of had an 80s pop feel to it. Yeah. And that that helps me understand because when you told me you had written this before, I was like, okay, that makes more sense. Well, I I loved uh, I loved a lot of aspects. First of all, I like the theme of the song. Uh, almost everybody that knows me and knows my music, uh, if you had to choose, uh, you know, the top three Tom Farley songs, that would definitely be in the top three. They they all and when people go on vacations, who are familiar with my music, uh, they'll they'll actually bring that one along so they. Can, they can sing it, you know, so if they get frustrated as far as the driving on the trip, they can have a laugh, so to speak. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there was a, there were a lot of things. I loved Jerry's lead in that. Um, I loved uh, the way that Tony and I uh, did the uh, little two-part harmony in, in the verses. Um, plus, uh, that was that was a song that was done on my um, um, Takamini uh, guitar. It was a guitar with a, a built-in pickup system, which Bob really loved. I, I it, it was he said it was without a doubt the 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 flattest EQ guitar that he ever recorded it made recording really really easy it had a nice full thing and I love the, the the rhythm licks in that song uh they're they're genuine and they're fun and they go along with the interesting tempo that that, so, that song has but uh you know Tony has her keyboard part but you know Jerry's leads and stuff were were wonderful and we had we had a good time doing that we also had a great time performing it because people really appreciated that song when we did it live because we could do it except for the sound effects at the beginning we could do it just like the album and they really appreciated that i hear you <laughs> but i got to i got to ask you as i was listening to this song because we're living in the times that we live in and everybody has a new lexicon that's very sensitive. You can't say certain things. And I listen to that song and you, (laughs) because they're incredibly stupid. Yeah. And I was like, I got to ask them. And then the whole thing about the 50 millimeter gun, have some fun. Could you write that song the same way now? If you were to sit down and write that song with the same sentiment, could you use those words right now? Well, probably uh, not, especially the 50 millimeter gun. I, I I always thought that you know there was a period where road rage, uh, I guess maybe the you know in the early 2000s, uh, especially up around DC, there were people that were just absolutely out of their, no, they still are, but they're absolutely out of their mind. Um, and uh, it, plus, I had students, you know, that heard that song. You know, would would I be influencing somebody? Well, it's been over thirty years. I, I don't think that any that that song has caused anybody to go off the charts or all, off the cliff, so to speak. And um, uh, we did it in, in concert, um, both at at uh, at the Steel Pier, but also at the Library some years before. And people, when you get that uh, the the fifty millimeter gun part, uh, you know, uh, strap it on the hood and have some fun. They they all laugh. I mean, people enjoy the humor of that, you know, which, you know, I, I'm not saying go out there and kill people. What, who the hell would ever go down that road? Uh, there might be somebody, but that's not what the song was about. So, uh, you know, it's, it's that little that little bit of daydreaming that people have, you know, in that split second when they're pissed off uh, at, at, a, at a slow driver. But certainly, you know, it, it was <laughs> it. it it would be a different song probably if I wrote it now. I mean, but you know, back then, uh, who gives a shit? I mean, you know, we just put it out there and see how people like, it. and they loved it. So that's all know. that matters. That's all that matters. <laughs> yeah. But I, I did flinch when you said that. I was like, Ooh, man, I wonder if you write that the same way. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs>
drivers in the left hand lane I do believe they'll drive me crazy Slow drivers in the left hand lane Oh no They're incredibly stupid day I go to work out on the interstate highway I get behind some stupid jerk doing 40 miles an hour gonna drive me crazy he's a slow driver in the left hand lane I do believe his brain is lazy slow drivers in the left hand lane They're incredibly stupid Get a 50 millimeter gun Strap it on the hood And have some fun Get an SD in my laser sight Push the button through the flames and firelight What a delight To see the slow drivers in the left hand lane I do believe they'll drive me crazy Slow drivers in the left hand lane Oh no They're incredibly stupid They're always in the way they're incredibly stupid They're out there every day Every day! They're incredibly stupid The law they don't obey They're incredibly stupid They're out there every day They're always in the way Fresh Air, my first thought was this had to be influenced by all of the time that you spent at Virginia Tech. That was my first thought. And again, I ha you know, you have to know you to know that information. But for me, now that I know you, listening to the song, understanding where you were at that time in your life, understanding the environment that you had exposed, you know, that you were exposed to at that time in your life. Is that right, or was it a whole nother thought? Um, it came from a different place. I mean, there were a lot of natural moments at Tech that certainly uh, uh, formed the basis or the background uh, that would uh, would bring that song out. But also, that song was done in a period, uh, there were only two guitar parts. Uh, my finger-picking part, uh, which was done uh, on my Guild F50 Jumbo, but also it was done in open D tuning. Which you know, I haven't I haven't tuned my guitar down, done open D tuning in years. I need to get back into that because it really offers up a, an incredible variety of of different uh, you know fingerings and styles and stuff like that. Uh, also, I was you know I was 
really into working out different parts with the open D tuning and my finger picking, which, you know, I would, it would take me a long time to, to actually repeat that song, I think. Um, but at the same time, I was also developing a, a nice recording uh, uh, relationship with Tom Jones. Now, Tom is, is like, you know, one of the best guitarists to ever come out of Southeast Virginia. Uh, I, I look to him as having the creative, uh, 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 you know, sense about him and the skill set, the same as uh, uh, like like Greg Weichel would have um, that in the more recent recordings. And Tom, we we did that recording at at uh, Live Oak uh, with Jim Michaels on the board, and we did it live. I uh, wasn't like I put down mine and Tom put his stuff. You know, I was in one part of the studio, Tom was in another. Headphones on, boom, and it was done. And Tom's Tom's lead work there was just absolutely perfect. He just has that sense about him, and of course, he's just a, a quality player no matter what. So that particular song had had a, a certain liveliness and a certain outdoorsy kind of feel to it, and uh, he really brought that out. And but yeah, the the college experiences uh, out in nature and stuff like that were certainly reflected on. But it was more like I really want to to, to get this open D tuning thing. Uh, I had the melody. I wanted to get it down pat, and I wanted Tom to be on there with me because I knew uh, that but, you know, between the two of us, we'd be able to make something really special out of it. Well, I think the other thing that I appreciate about it, and this is from um, an editing standpoint, a post-production standpoint, I have, and this is, a, this is a theme in all of the songs in this record, and you know, you're playing in general, but I just really want to throw out there um, your performance in your doubles was amazing. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Well, because you, you can hear the fullness in what doubles are supposed to do. Yeah. But because it's actually a double, it doesn't have phase issues. That's right. You're and absolutely because, right. Yeah, because and then you did it in you did it in 1991. So that lets me know the software that I use to correct things constantly didn't exist. That's right. That's just work. That's just grind. And That's so right. again, this is I don't want to mention it anymore because again, it's a theme um for a few tracks in particular, but really it's a theme th throughout the whole record. And I really want to let you know that the performances on this record, vocally and instrumentally, were really, really good. And it really showed up for me personally when I knew that it was more than one instrument playing at the same time. Well, thank you, man. I, that, that means a lot coming from you. Uh, uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, getting, getting those things down pat, getting them recorded, um, Bob was, when we first, the first song that we did, uh, that I actually, you know, doubled uh, my finger picking part. At the end of it, he just looked at me like, I can't believe you did that. You know, I, but but to me, uh, the whole idea of rhythm and syncopation has always been one of my strong suits. Uh, people who play with me, uh, you know, they, they know that basically I'm not going to be screwing around with the rhythm because I know exactly how important it is that, to have something that's that's solid and all the way through that they can actually have fun with if they're playing lead or that I can blend together with a drummer and a bass player and whoever else uh, might be adding, uh, you know, rhythm chops. Uh, it, it, to me, that's, that's, that sends me an, an incredibly good feeling to be able to know that I can do that. It's something, it's the reason why I, when I practice, uh, I'll practice just with me and my acoustic guitar, but lots of times, uh, the majority of times I'll practice in the evenings playing along to the songs that I've recorded. And it's twofold. I, I want to make sure that I can still do that, which I can. But also, like if I'm playing uh, Calm Before the Storm, it is nothing, you know, like playing along and hearing all of a sudden Mike Munden, you know, come in with his violin. I mean, you know, I, I, I can play along with Mike, you know. It, it, it makes it uh, uh, a really, really uh, very worthwhile practice session. And it reinforces to me the fact that I can actually still do that, which is important to me. I understand. Well, speaking of great performances, baby, can I hold you? One of my favorite Tanya performances. Man, geez. Did she nail that shit or what? Yeah, she did, man. <laughs> I remember the first time I heard it and I was like, are you for real? And I was like, okay. Cause I had heard the original. She killed it, man. So I'm not going to say a whole lot about it, except I'll ask you, how did you choose the cover? But really just tell the story. Well, the, the neat thing about it was, was that uh, we, of course, you know, got that song squared away and arranged uh, on stage before we actually took it into the studio. 
Uh, Tanya's vocals were, were stunning. Uh, there are people out there who genuinely say, you know, uh, I know that, uh, you know, uh, that uh, Fleetwood Mac and uh, all the rest of that stuff, uh, you know, the, the Landslide, the Stevie Nicks and all the rest of that, but I love the sound of Tanya's voice and I love the version that you have. I mean, so, um, which is very gratifying. I mean, these people are, are not blowing smoke. They're, they're, they're genuinely uh, really loved, uh, because they loved it so much on the album, they loved to see Tanya do it live, which we were able to repeat live, you know, uh, maybe not with uh, Mike's... Um, a violin or, or or anything like that in the background but you know lick for lick i still to this day practice you know playing that song to make sure that every single lick you know is exactly where it's supposed to be because that's the way people want to hear it I, I, of course it gives me a great feeling to know that i can still perform it that way um i don't think i, I could ever play that song for anybody uh, but tanya singing it uh, it's just you know it's that close to me but you know she she was able to to get it. She did the vocals in one take. You know that that to me uh, speaks volumes. Uh, so many people can screw up or stumble, but you know she had done it many times and and it was comfortable. And of course, you know Mike's uh, violin lead on that was was stunning. Uh, he's a great player. Um, so at the end of the day, we really, really uh, that was that was um, a, a, an easy choice to put on there. But the icing on top of the cake is, is Jerry's lead. Uh, you notice that it, as the song progresses uh, 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 on Baby Can I Hold You, uh, basically it starts off with me and Tanya and lead guitar and stuff like that. I mean, with rhythm guitar. And Jerry comes in on the second just with just with some light, you know, some light uh, uh, rhythm fills, so to speak. And then he takes off in his lead. His lead is, is spectacular. It's a great lead. Uh, very much, uh, you know, in tune with exactly what the song is all about. Not too much, not too little. Great tone. It, it, it is Jerry at his very, very best. And so, "Baby, Can I Hold You?" is is was a uh, you know a song that uh, we've always loved. Uh, it, plus, it's also one of the best program songs on the album. I love the drums in that song, uh, and uh, we were able to to blend them in to where it was really, really really quite substantial. It was, it was really a great experience doing that one. That's a great one. That's a great song. I mean, we'll get the last slide later, but that's another one where I think her voice, especially if you're a Fleetwood Mac, uh, a Fleetwood Mac fan, um, that's pretty close. Yeah. I mean, plus, Nick, you so. know, um, uh, as far as the, uh, the lead work, I mean that Jerry's lead was an original lead, uh, which is something that I loved. I wanted to have something that was unique. Uh, Tanya's voice, uh, being as low as it is, uh, was unique enough. But at the end of the day, uh, uh, so so much about that song could have fallen flat on his face if if the lead would have been too rocky or uh, you know rock and rolly or whatever the case might be, or the tone was too thin or whatever. We had that stuff. You know, we make sure that it was engineered exactly the way we wanted to get the feel that we wanted. And of course, Tanya's performance just took it up took it took it all you know all right over the top i mean it was it was just awesome and to actually the neat thing is to actually watch her do it you know uh to to be there when it happens um you know uh there's no uh there's no way that you can actually express how really cool that is i understand so now here I, in the beginning of this i said i had a problem with tom because he like keeps secrets and we're going to work all this stuff out right now because I'm listening to it. And it's like, you know, I, I, I'm getting what I expect from Tom and, that, and that's cool. Record's great. And I'm just kind of bopping along. And then toe, toe, toe comes on. <laughs> now, do you want to help me understand why you choose to not talk about this song at all? Well, all the years I, I've known you, you have never spoken about this particular song in the batch of songs that you talk about constantly, and I have no idea why. Well, first of all, you know, if I'm not performing it with Tanya and Jerry, uh, there, there seems, I mean, I tried doing it solo. Uh, for some reason, it just doesn't come across as well as when the, when the harmonies are there. Uh, you know, I hear Tanya's keyboard part, and Jerry's lead part, my harmonica part being played. And, you know, I wasn't the kind of guy that played harmonica along with my acoustic and solo. So it, it just seemed very blah to actually do it, you know, as a solo. So that song was only performed um, uh, when we were playing live. Now, when we were recording it, I, I went over to Jerry's house and his, um, 
his uh, young uh, daughter was much younger then. Her name was Stephanie. And uh, that was the song that she loved the most. I mean, he played all the tracks and was you know, doing his you know parts and practicing, getting ready to go into the studio and stuff like that. And uh, Stephanie, would, whenever Toe, Toe, Toe came on, man, she was right there. So, I mean, at the end of the day, I kind of said, you know, if this appeals to her, you know, maybe it'll appeal to other kids. Maybe it's something, uh, just the whole hook line, you know, would, would actually be very appealing uh, to some folks as far as singing along. But the truth of the matter is, is that they had a racket going down at the beach. They did. I mean, if you parked anywhere near close to being illegal, they would tow your car in a New York minute and you had to go pay serious money to get it back. The guys who ran the tow trucks in the city, I swear, they were in cahoots somehow, man, because I had more friends than not that had their cars towed back to the lot, had to go uh, pick them up, paid uh, either $25 or $40, I forget what it was, per hit. Those people were making a killing. That was before they had, uh, you know, um, parking meters and stuff like that down at the beach. So, uh, and if you were a tourist, you were screwed because you didn't know, you know, which end was up as far as how to park or where to park down there. So, yeah, I mean, that, that, and of course, Waterside, when it got started, they had parking problems. They eventually worked them out, but, you know, so that's the reason that verse was there. But yeah, that, that, you know, that was a problem, you know, uh, you have friends that come down and see you at the beach and all of a sudden they go back to go home after having a couple of drinks and a good time and their car is gone. It's like, you know, <laughs> I understand your pain, you know, so to speak. And so that song came out of that experience. Well, that was, that's my, my favorite. I mean, it really has got a good feel to it. And um, I don't know, is it called marimba? Who was playing that in the solo? Well, Tanya, Tanya played that on her keyboard. Oh, okay. And it was a marimba sound. Uh, which was on. Uh, she played that on her keyboard. Uh, that was con- uh, that was a convincing sample. That was that was good because I thought somebody. I thought y'all hired somebody to come in and play that. Well, you know, at the time, you know, EPS uh, people were were recording uh, different sounds that you could buy, you know, on disc to, to load into your EPS. There weren't a whole ton of them um, that were really that great, but the marimba one was. You know, and when Tanya, all Tanya had to do was to hit the button on her channel uh, for that particular set. And, you know, we loaded in all the instruments by set. She hit that particular thing and bam, off she went. Uh, so it, it was a good, it was a fun thing uh, to, uh, for her to play. And it also, you know, uh, um, it broadened her aspect of, instead of just piano and strings, uh, a, a different way to actually apply the keyboard to, to things that she really liked to do. Okay. Well, you tell her that was masterful. Because I really enjoy that whole song, and I still don't. I know I don't appreciate the fact that you don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I mean, yeah, I, it, it, it's it's special. I mean, uh, you know, all the songs on there are special. But like I said, um, the continuation of keeping the song uh, ever present uh, would have had to have been done with my solo after Jerry left in '96, and uh, you know, it just didn't feel right. I didn't have fun playing it uh, well, like I did when I was playing with them. Well, I realize that. I do. And I'm familiar with the story, and I understand. However, I saw Sting do Message in a Bottle by himself. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel the same, and it's not supposed to, but it's no less amazing. And that's my whole point. Did you see him at the amphitheater? I did not. I, I saw him at the amphitheater, and he did that song solo there, too. And it was masterful. It, it had had a great atmosphere to it. That's that's my whole point. It's not supposed to feel like it felt when you have three or four different people playing with you, but the bones of the song, it's amazing. It's a great song. Well, if I get a chance to throw it out there again, man, I will. I, I will take your advice. I hope you do because it, it's <laughs> infectious for real. <laughs> toe, 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 toe in my car away. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Come 
to Virginia Beach for a lark Lay in the sun till it gets dark But there is no place to park It's a hundred in the shade I pulled to a side street parking lot It's all full up, car is hot Two, three hours is all I got What a big mistake I made Have fun by the rolling tide The city take me for a ride Gotta park a mile away There's a lesson to be learned You gotta learn to walk a mile Or you're gonna get burned No appeal court is adjourned When they tow your car away Come on now Tow, tow, tow a hundred in the shade I pulled to a side street parking lot It's all full up The car is hot Two, three hours is all I got What a big mistake I made Come on now Okay, professional backroads man. Now, for me, being familiar with you, this is the epitome of high energy acoustics. I don't care what nobody says. Now, you could say something different. It's your, you know, it's your tagline. It's your deal. However, when I listen to that, that song kind of smacks you in the face. It does. That's 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 a that's a, that's a kick your ass type of song. So it is, and, and yeah, I, I, you know, the whole idea of high energy acoustics it, that that song is one of the top ones to actually display that. Um, the the thing that I loved about that song is we got the energy. Um, uh, you know, the band kicked up the energy. I wish I would have reprogrammed it to, to back off on the kick drum a little bit in certain parts, but uh, at the end of the day. Uh, the vocals were were tight and, and and right on there. Jerry's leads were great, and 
uh, it do, it did have an energy. I mean, it started right from the first bap. I mean, you know, it 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 takes off, and uh, you know, it's great fun to play rhythm to that song. Uh, you can have a lot of fun in in all the aspects of that song. So, um, uh, plus, you know, on the album, Donnie takes on the last lead, which you know, uh, you know, it, it, there's something about Donnie that actually, you know. He's he's the cherry on top of the Sunday. He's he's the guy that adds that little special something with his pedal steel guitar, and uh, you know I always think of uh, of him. The, there were very few times we were able to actually perform that song live with Donnie there. Like uh, sometimes we did it at the acoustic artist and resonance shows that we would have on Thanksgiving Eve at Reisner's. Donnie would be there, and we'd make a special point to make sure that that uh, song was played. Uh, simply because you know we, you know we have Donnie there, we don't have the chance to do it. Let's let's do it, you know. So, uh, so that 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 that's a fun part uh, of that particular song as well. But it has an energy to it, and we <laughs> we did a version of it uh, in a in a, a concert thing that we did it at Michael's. Uh, the concert version is, uh, is on the uh, Tom Farley the uh, Songsmith in the Basement cuts. It's the last song uh, on the album, or next to the last song on the album. It had Rick Price playing bass and and Jimmy Dunn was playing electric guitar and um, uh, but the thing is the song had the energy and everybody was into it but we had you know it was like all the, the the musicians came together at that particular time to do it and the one thing that I forgot to do was okay let's end it like this you know the ending of the song just kind of crapped out <laughs> which you know uh, you know we made a joke of it at the end but uh, at if it wasn't for that concert, we wouldn't have concentrated on making the ending with the bam, 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 which I think is a great ending for that song. Um, and so we we came up with that ending after the the, the fluke that we had we playing uh, for fun at Michael's that one Sunday afternoon. Okay. Well, other question I had about this song was, number one, what were you thinking when you wrote it or what was your inspiration in writing it? Or was it you just jamming on a progression and the song wrote itself? Well, it, it, twofold in that. Um, one <laughs> one day, uh, Denny Smith, who uh, uh, was a, a, a very influential on the songs with album, we were both up at Tech at the same time, and so Denny and I, you know, uh, uh, got in got into uh, my car, and we like to cruise the back roads outside around Newport, outside off campus, and uh, so we were out there. It was a beautiful day. Traveling down these all these back roads, you know, turning down this one. Hey, let's go down that one. That kind of thing. Well, the interesting part about it was, every road that we turned down had this old guy in a truck, and every single time he passes, you know how country people are. They'll wave at you when they pass. That kind of yep. thing. Uh, he would. He had his arm out on his, uh, you know, uh, on the window, and he would just like raise his index finger, like to say howdy. But it was amazing. We saw that guy like five or six times that day. And we went down these roads. We did not have a pattern. But uh, every single road, it seemed like we went down. This guy was coming the other way and gave us a little, you know, wave with his, his index finger. And so we nicknamed him a professional back roads man. That's all he does is drive the back roads, you know. <laughs> and so, so, you know, that was our own little laugh, so to speak. Uh, so that was in the back of my mind. But then, you know, the whole idea of... Um, of actually, you know, at college, I didn't have a chance to really perform. Uh, so the whole idea of performing and seeing my other friends, like Denny had a group called Happy, which was an excellent group, and they performed. I used to love to go out and listen to them. And so the whole idea of performance and the whole idea of of uh, the natural part of being in, into the tech experience all, you know, kind of came together in that song. Plus, you know, the the, the whole humor aspect of it or the, the spirit of it was the professional back rows man. But I had to I had to put down a second, you know, like a little subtitle, rolling set of wheels, because unless you knew the story, professional back rows man really doesn't make any sense at all when it comes down to the to the actual song itself. But it made a hell of a lot of sense to me. And so that I just left it up there and, and put down the, the subtitle so people would have something to work with that they knew. Got it. That song is tight. I mean, it's moving and there are no loose ends. It's tight. Oh, and, and that was that was a ton of fun to perform. I bet it was. Uh, I, I don't mind tell you because we had the keyboard, you know, uh, and you know Jerry loved. Jerry had a nice long lead part which he could break into two different uh, voices on his on his Gibson, and so you know he had a fun time playing it. Uh, 
uh, we always had a fun time singing it because the vocals are, that's probably out of all the songs that we did together, the vocals on that one were, were, were so much, you know, Tom, Tanya, and Jerry. I mean, that was our sound, and, and it came across really well. Bob did a hell of a job with that. He really did. Now, coming apart at the seams is the vocal performance is dark. The key is dark. What, what was what were you going through? Because I saw I heard some of the lyrics and I really listened to it. And I'm familiar with some some darker moments in your life. Where were you at mentally? What were you going through when you wrote that one? Well, when it comes right down to it, um, that song was written at the end of the uh, band breakup with um, uh, with Cam. Uh, at that particular time, uh, we were kind of, you know, up in the air. 
Uh, there were two people involved in that particular van that were really pretty close. Cam, because of the long experience we had starting off as a duo and then working into the full band and the su success that we had as the Tom Farley Cam Head Band. But also, um, the last bass player that we really had in that band was uh, Vernon Martin, who we had experience with in Cimarron, but also, uh, you know, added that vocal advantage uh, to, to the band, but also played bass. He was also married to my sister-in-law, Tanya's younger sister, Joanne. So he was family. But between the two of them, uh, there was, uh, we didn't really get into any kind of uh, uh, verbal, you know, conversations about it. But there was a feeling, a feeling that I could see. And there were habits that they had, um, you know, uh, the whole idea of, uh, you know, the, the, the line says, uh, I can feel I'm see I'm going nowhere, drifting into time, a constant paranoia with a little twist of lime. That was Vernon. He loved to drink um, drinks and, and have a, a lime twist on the top of it. Uh, I, one, man calls, uh, one man calls me brother, the other calls me friend. Well, I looked at that as being uh, Vernon calling me brother and Cam calling me friend. Uh, and the chorus, I think, says it all. Um, uh, uh, basically... You know, I, I just got tired of, of I guess you could say, a, a sense or an atmosphere of, of negativity or or not moving ahead or not growing or whatever. And when it actually broke up, um, uh, I tried to start all over and get into something new. Uh, that was that was the thing. And that's when the keyboard came in and that's when Jerry came in. So we were able to resurrect you know, the sound that we had with something completely new. But with uh, with great songs, and you know, we're able to move on from that particular position because that was a dark time. It was it was hard not to you know to get uh, you know in a club every single weekend and have the energy that we had with that band and the quality that we had with that band. I mean, I got videos out there that shows exactly how good that band was. So at the end of the day, you know, um, that song was did have a kind of a, like a dark overtone. And I think Jerry's lead uh, is spectacular in terms of uh, translating that in terms of, uh, you know, exactly what I was feeling at the time, even though we didn't really talk about it all that much. That's what I thought. I didn't I didn't want to guess, but that's what I thought when I really, really listened to the to the lyrics. And that was a great mix, too, because the lyrics are very obvious. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, I, I like that. Uh, it has a, a certain drive to it, but also it can go from heavy strum into delight picking on the acoustic guitar. And and uh, Jerry's uh, rhythm, uh, you know, stylings on that were, were excellent. And I love singing that with Tanya. I mean, Tanya was a part of that, too. And uh, um, she felt the same thing I was feeling when we were singing it. So it kind of it translated into the recording and, and made it even better than uh, we ever hoped it could be. Dream. 
now we're back to landslide. Now we had kind of thrown some stuff out there earlier. Um, again, it's one of my favorite performances. I can't really decide which is my absolute favorite, but landslide. Oh my goodness. Tanya killed this one. And I think, I think for me, it means a little more because of the timbre of uh, her voice being so close to Stevie Nicks's voice. Mm -hmm. Um, Tell a story, man. I mean, what's up? Tanya always loved this song. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, uh, but Tanya, you know, the, the one thing is, is that uh, um, I, I, I developed a finger-picking uh, arrangement with it, uh, something that she was comfortable with. I mean, she was so used to, to singing along with, with Stevie Nicks that, you know, I felt like, you know, uh, am I really going to be able to please uh, this woman with, the, with the, the, the style that I have as far as playing it? But um, she liked it because basically uh, she phrased things uh, very, very, very similarly uh, to uh, Stevie Nicks. But uh, she had her own, uh, I guess you say, warmth that she brought to the song, her own, her own interpretation, which I think was really, really good. Uh, uh, like I said, Mike Munden was stellar on, on the uh, violin part, which was, you know, they did not have a violin part in the original, which actually made our version stand out a little bit more. And since this part was so good, it really was, uh, you know, it, it allowed the song to shine the way it was supposed to. But after all was said and done, it was it was the vocal interpretation um, uh, that Tanya brought to it that that made it the song that it is. Uh, it, it you know, people say that that artists have signature songs. Well, "Baby Can I Hold You" and uh, "Landslide" are two of her signature songs, mainly because throughout all the time that we played, uh, those songs were pretty much ever present. Uh, and uh, even yeah, we played it in, in uh, uh, at the concert at, um, at Steel Pier. She was still into doing it there. She wanted to do it for her younger sister. Uh, so at, at the end of the day, it's, it's a special connection that uh, that we have uh, to, I guess you could say, a cover tune. But also, it's a special time for uh, for Tanya and I. I can sit there and uh, and pick it, and um, uh, and I can look over. Uh, uh, when she says, uh, I've been afraid of changing because I built my life around you, which is one of the lyrics. What she would do is at, at that particular time, she would look over to me as a sign of her love for me. Every once in a while, I, I, I wouldn't be so involved in the, in the finger picking that I would realize she would do that. And I would look over to her and we'd be able to smile at each other. Uh, when you do that uh, for so many years on so many stages in front of so many people, um, it becomes special. You know, it, it 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 always has been special, and like to this day, I still, you know, that's that's the first song on my acoustic guitar finger picking, you know, playlist that I that I practice to, uh, to make sure that uh, I stay sharp because it brings back the memory. But also, I want to make sure that uh, if there ever comes a time where we actually do that again, that all she'll have to do is step up to a mic, and I will be totally ready for that. Understood. Great song, great performance by both of y'all. Was that, that's one of my favorites. Well, thank you, man. I'll pass that on. And that leads into something else. Um, older, familiar play. I don't understand why you don't talk about these gems, bro. What in the world? My favorite part of this song, it's a great song, but my favorite part of this song, when I finally really was able to get into the lyric part of it, I was like, no, he didn't. <laughs> Lyrics on this are awesome. Okay, tell the story, man. How did you write this? Well, I love the chorus. I, I mean, you know, um, there, there's, there comes a time when you really would like to, to write a song that you consider to be um, somewhat autobiographical. But, you know, there also comes a time in life where you actually realize who you are. There are things that you do, uh, you know, um, uh, like the line, should I spend some more time in production? Can I think of a better way? That is me 150%. That's the, what I do. I do it in my music. I do it in my teaching. I mean, there, there, that's just, just me. You know, the whole idea of the uh, the theater, you know, I guess you could say theme throughout the entire thing as far as the lyrics are concerned. I've always enjoyed theater. Uh, theater was a minor to me and when I was up at Tech. I, I wasn't acting, but I was into the technical thing, you know, lights and stage and, you know, sets and stuff like that. But it was very much—I was very much a part of the theatrical world, even in high school. Uh, Hugh Copeland was a first-year teacher at Bayside High School, uh, and he was my drama teacher. And so I got—he allowed me and a couple other guys to, to run the sound of the lights, uh, rather, uh, yeah, the sound of the lights 
for him. And that ended up being a great experience. So I had that theatrical, you know, uh, old and familiar play uh, aspect uh, um, uh, with me at all times. But there are certain things, you know, that you uh, that you learn. Um, I, I, you know, I have uh, I, I'm fortunate enough to have been able to have the opportunity to get uh, not only a bachelor's but a master's degree. Um, I, but I, you know, and I taught at, at Virginia Western University for 28 years, uh, which I'm very proud of. But you know, it's something that I don't consider to be. Um, I like to consider myself modestly educated because I know that there's still so much that I can learn, uh, whether it's in, uh, you know, in the desire for things or in the degrees that I've earned. And like the, like the, like the, 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 uh, the verse says, I really do consciously, honestly try to do the best I can by my friends and my family. I, you know, that is something I believe that my parents taught me. Um, and you know, so that, uh, you know, that that's very much a part of me. Uh, Tony and I, when we were able to travel, um, were able to go to the mountains to where, um, uh, you know, basically to see my parents when they were alive and even to visit their grave in Floyd um, uh, after they passed. Uh, And, uh, you know, the whole idea of of going there and looking back at my life and seeing exactly how I got to be the way that I am and where I am is a very, very um, uh, important thing. Uh, The teaching. I learned a ton from my students. So when I say I should listen to the wisdom of the very small, um, that's what that's all about. I mean, they have a certain wisdom and a certain way of looking at the world that that uh, allows me to to understand things from a different perspective. And it, you only get that when you respect what your students have to say and and that they respect you enough to 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 not throw a load of bullshit at you and just you know tell exactly how they feel. And I feel like for, for many of the students that I had, we had that kind of relationship and we were able to, you know, to, to be able to, you know, I could learn from them. And of course, the last one, I, I should spend some more time with my wife. I mean, Tanya spent, <laughs> I can't tell you how long it took to, to, to program that band with that keyboard. I can't tell you how long it takes to, to actually set up. Well, you would know. I do know. Uh, you're, you're an engineer how long it takes to record and mix and master all the tracks for an album. I mean, you're, you're, you're in the house, but you're gone. You know, you got your headphones on, you got your speakers turned up, you're in another world. And she allowed me to have that. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I needed to repay that. I needed to spend time with her. Um, you know, so spending more time with my wife uh, is, you know, something I'm doing now, but uh, now that I'm retired, but, Back in the day, that was something that uh, I that was really very much a part of me. But but it's also something that she understood. Um, so yeah, I, I like the. To me, it 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 says I finally know who I am, you know. And these are the things that make me who I am. So and I'm I'm, I'm happy with it and I'm proud of it. And it just so happened <laughs> that uh, you know Tom Jones was there again, you know, to 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 make it all happen with me. Yeah, you know, his lead is is stellar. It, it, Tom is just an amazing guitar player, and he made that song happen. That's all there is to it. Understood. Can I think of a better way? I'm 
just playing the part of Tommy in an old and familiar place. Promenade Blues. For me, the experience as a listener was guitars, guitars, guitars. Oh, yeah. I wanted to know what mics y'all used. I wanted to know who mixed it, how it was mixed, because the stereo separation on it was amazing. Whoever mixed that was like, whoa. Yeah, Bob mixed that. Now, Bob knew, knew what the hell he was doing. Um, I played that in, in open D. Okay. Actually, it was, wasn't an open D. I actually tuned the, uh, the two E strings down to D. And played it uh, uh, with that, which gave it that really full sound. That uh, Guild F50 Jumbo, um, it it doesn't get the recognition that it it deserves because it's a hell of a guitar and it has an incredible full sound to it. So I, I really enjoyed it. Bob, I think I'm not exactly sure what Mike or Mike's I should say Bob used on that. Um, I used one of the the pencil mics. I don't know if it's an SM71 or something along those lines. I don't even know if they had them back then. But um, but he used a, a large condenser and a, uh, I guess you could say, well, a pencil type uh, mic to, to record that guitar. Jerry was just right on top of it. Uh, the we all had experienced what it was like down at the beach. Uh, that song was written on a break. We were playing Abbey Road, and uh, you know we were taking uh, taking a break. And I went out to uh, to the boardwalk, and all of a sudden, you know, waves crashing. You look around and you see what's going on. You walk back toward the club and. There are people, you know, you can see that they were selling drugs, you know, you know, uh, on the street corner, that kind of thing. It, it wasn't like, you know, prevalent on every street corner, but you could see it was one o'clock in the morning and people wanted to get their last fix before they went home. And all that stuff was very much a part of what it was like at late night, uh, you know, at the beach uh, during the summer. So uh, it just, bam, it just snapped. I went home that night and sat down and wrote it. So, um yeah, it, uh, it 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 worked out. And plus, you know, working out the parts with uh, um, 
with with Jerry and Tanya was was a ton of fun. I mean, because it was a fresh song, it wasn't something that was coming from a prior experience. That one was fresh off the grill, so to speak. And so we had a good time putting that together. Okay. Um, you know, I laughed at you on this one, Kinky with my baby, because I was like, okay, were you inspired because you was being nasty? Or was <laughs> in the afternoon, or <laughs> or was being nasty in the afternoon inspired you to write the tune? So which one was it? A little of both. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, that those are just you know special moments. Uh, yeah, what can you say? You're special, all right. Uh, yeah, that had uh, uh, as far as the lyrics and everything are concerned. I mean, I per- that's pretty much straightforward. I can remember uh, after we did that song, uh, um, uh, one of the dance teachers. At um, at Indian River Junior High before it went middle school, uh, Indian River Junior High uh, wanted to use some of my, which I was honored. She wanted to use some of my songs, so I gave her um, uh, the the CD, and uh, <laughs> uh, she said, "I listened to Kinky with my baby, and I had to turn it down because I didn't want my daughter to." <laughs> <laughs> So I mean, you know, so I mean, you know, it, I don't consider it all that raising. No, like it's pretty tame for nowadays. I mean, there's no doubt about it. But um, uh, I think not only the lyrics and the fun of singing it, because uh, that's a that's a full blown, uh, you know, three part harmony almost all the way through. Uh, but uh, also that was uh, BJ Lederman did the the rhythm keyboards on that, right. and that's a special moment. I you know I love BJ, I uh, love his style, and and he was there. And willing, and so why the hell not? Let's, let's, let's get him in here and, and do that. It, it was like, you know, it was a perfect addition. What It's a great cameo, no doubt about it. Okay. <laughs> I did laugh at you, though. That's funny. <laughs> not mad either. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, we had our moments. There's no doubt about it. I hear you. That's good. <laughs> Healthy. <laughs> okay. You don't have to. If I were to hazard a guess, I would say you wrote this about Tanya. Is that about right? No, I wrote that for my mother. Your mother? Yeah, that that was a, a song written for mom. Um, uh, I consider, uh, as far as women are concerned, uh, uh, the two closest uh, uh, friends that I've had as women have been Tanya and my mother. Uh, she's She was great. Um, and she did everything um, just naturally. I mean, you know, uh, her being uh, being, doing the motherly things, was just as natural as can be, and um, she did all those things. Um, you know, she didn't have to do them, but she did them. You know, because that's what she felt like a mother was all about. And and she was a great mom. Uh, Tanya Tanya loved her, uh, and so uh, that the neat thing about that song is that not only translates uh, uh, some of the feelings that I have for her, but she was able to hear that when she was still alive. Wow. You know, which was wonderful. You know, I, I, you know, it's something I wanted her to hear. I didn't want to save it till after she passed away or anything. I wanted her to know how I felt, and she liked it. Uh, that that meant a lot to me. I, it, basically, I sent it up to to them at, on the on a CD before we actually had a chance to 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 go there. And between that song and "Missing My Old Man," which is written for my dad, of course, um, the thing is, is that you know they both really, really enjoyed. Uh, the fact that uh, that I honored them with a the song, but also that the songs turned out so well. Okay, That's, and I, you know, I guess I wasn't too far off because I knew it was an important woman. I knew that. Oh yeah, so that makes sense. You don't have to take. Or let me bend your ear You don't have to speak so gently When you wipe away my tear You've always been my dearest friend In a life where friends were few Your love you bring Like all those things that you don't have to do
You don't have to send the notion to show me that you care. And you don't have to give the emotion when so much love is there. It's hard to find a heart so kind and a beauty warm and true. Your love you bring. Like all those things that you don't have to do. So over you, the first thing that jumped out at me was the sax sound. Yeah. And that came from the EPS? Yes, it did. Okay, because I was like, I know it's the sax, but that had to come from the EPS, and I wanted to make sure, so that's why I'm asking you. So who made the decision to put that on as opposed to hiring someone? I Well, to tell you the truth, I did hire somebody. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, and they they came in, and uh, this is a person who I really re- respected uh, at the time. And um, uh, they came in and put it down, and I could not use a single passage. I mean, you know, I, they they were kind enough to give their time and stuff like that, but it just didn't fit. So I had an idea how, how I wanted to do uh, uh, the the sax part. The problem is, is that the EPS, as good as it is. Did not really have the performance controls that a lot of keyboards have now, mm-hmm. as far as bending and, and stretching and uh, those kinds of right. things. So it, it, it's it's kind of straightforward and and uh, you know doesn't have a lot of stylish you know essence to it, but it has the melody that I wanted uh, to put in there. And so you know at, at that uh, uh, song was um, just written as you know it, it, thinking about somebody who had. Uh, was pining away for somebody that they had lost, a lost love, so to speak. Okay, okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, nobody in particular. Uh, so, uh, but but the sax part, uh, um, I did the lead myself as well. As a matter of fact, that's uh, one of those songs that I did, you know, it was totally me. Uh, the harmonies and all the rest of that kind of stuff. Bob worked with me on the harmonies, and that was fun to do. So, uh, yeah, but that, that, that song was never, ever performed live on stage at any time. Okay. I, I remember I remember hearing it and I was like, I gotta ask him about the sax. But that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. And the and the funny thing is that you actually hired somebody, it just didn't work out, which okay. Well, I did that also for uh, an electric guitar part. Um hired one of the, what was who was considered to be the, the best lead player um in the business. I won't mention his name right now, but uh um I felt like you know this, this guy is going to send this 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 song to the moon. This is going to be great, and it's like he didn't spend any time listening to the song at all. I mean, you know, to me, the people that I work with, mm-hmm. the people that I enjoy, and the people that I respect the most are the ones who can serve the damn song. Yeah. I mean, you know, to come in and, and listen to it, this is the tone it needs. This is the movement it needs. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, he had none of that. I was stunned. Uh, you know, I was just completely floored by the fact that he, it, the whole thing, I, when he walked out of the studio, I said, you can dump that track because I'm not using any of it. There's nothing there that I liked at all. Okay. Of course, I didn't say that to his face, but at the end of the day, you know, the fact that it wasn't on there, he knew exactly how I felt about how he performed. Wow. Wow. Okay. 
but you know that happens you know that happens in studio situations you you get people in there and um they just don't cut it so to speak okay but the, those i'll be honest with you though those two performances the sax and the lead on that particular song were the only two times where i actually had people in the studio where i did not use anything uh that they gave me because you know for some reason it always worked out all the other times okay well, Missing My Old Man, um, another one of my favorites. And again, I know I mentioned this again. I know I said I wouldn't mention it anymore. However, I have to say again, the the, the guitar performance and the vocal performances on this especially tight. Y'all worked hard on it. Yeah, we did. And I certainly appreciate it based on my own experience having to correct these things. Um, it's a great song from beginning to end. And um, I, th- I feel like it tells a story, especially for people who have lost a parent or both. And it was it was it was a good song, man. So tell us about it. Well, the first lyric uh, uh, I was working with my partner. Um, that was uh, me and Cam. Uh, Cam was living in South Norfolk, and we were uh, you know uh, trying to figure out better ways to to build speakers that we could actually handle as far as hauling you know on a weekly basis into clubs and stuff. Uh, we wanted to have the full sound, but you know we couldn't afford. Uh, to buy, you know, custom-made speakers or, you know, stuff that you could get out of, you know, Audio Light and Musical. So we built our own cabinets. We had great speakers. We used uh, JBLs in our cabinets. But the thing is, is that we had to build the cabinets themselves. So I went over there, and um, we were bu- working in this backyard, you know, saws and hammers and paint and all the rest of that stuff, putting together uh, the speakers we were going to use. And uh, his son, Cam Jr., uh, came out was you know, hanging out. He was just a little little teeny kid, maybe about three or four years old, something like at, at that time. And there was just a connection. I mean, I saw, you know, um, you know, for some reason the the kid being there took me back to being a kid. And we're like, you know, uh, when I say I could feel it when he handed me the tools. Uh, um, and then his his little Cam would ask Big Cam, "What about this, Daddy? What about that?" And all of a sudden, it just all got so familiar. Because my dad, uh, you know, was the guy who taught me how to use hammers and saws and all the rest of that kind of stuff. And I worked with him over the years on large projects and small ones. And um, it just seemed so familiar. You know, it just did. Um, uh, And and so, you know, you get to a point where, okay, uh, you sat back and you listened to your dad uh, for so many years. And all of a sudden you start saying the things that he said. Uh, the things at least that mattered that stuck with you, you know, that he said, um, and you realize where you came from. Um, and so like, you know, the line says, if I don't look back, I'll never understand. Uh, you know, you have to reflect, uh, and, and understand exactly where, where those parts of you came from. And there, I got a tremendous, uh, um, uh, I guess you could say, a, a feeling, uh, you know, uh, considering, you know, when you, th- when you talk about little kids, uh, especially if you're a teacher, you know for a fact, uh, like about, like especially seventh graders, seventh graders haven't really gotten to the point where they, they actually think for themselves. So that you know what they actually bring in to the classroom, they probably picked up at the dinner table. You know, heard mom and dad say it, I'm going to say it here in class, that kind of thing. The, even though they may not even know what they're talking about, they heard it and sounded good, so I'm going to say it. So, I mean, you know, so... Uh, you see that what you're telling is, is mostly due to what you have been told that, you know, you understand exactly the people who have said and done the things that have made you who you are. Uh, and my father was a very big part of that. I didn't, I didn't know that, uh, uh, you know, like anybody else who was like one of those epiphany, aha, uh, I can see where it all comes from moments. And of course it was very special. And so I wanted it, you know, because it was special and, and, and very, very simple in its in its meaning. I wanted to keep the song simple, so just finger picking guitar, uh, you know, a couple three tracks of it, of course, but uh, uh, finger picking guitar and a vocal, and that's pretty much it, you know. And uh, it worked. I, I, my dad was very proud of of my performance on that song, which made me, of course, incredibly happy.
I was working with my partner Just a little sweat and talk to pass the time Just a way to keep our music Our families and our business all in line There was something very special I could feel it when he handed me the tools When his son would ask the questions I realized who told me all these rules And I don't know who or why Is it he or is it I? And if I don't look back I'll never understand Head in hand And missing my old man And someday you'll be thinking Of ways that you've been bought and then been sold You'll see that what you're telling Is mostly due to what you have been told And when you search your memory And sift through all the shadows you will find That the maker is the father, the son is now the maker, and both of them are really one in kind. And I don't know who or why, is it he or is it I? And if I don't look back, I'll never understand. Head in hand And missing my old man Missing my old man Well, that's it, man. That's your body of work for that time in your life. Um, personally, I appreciate it. Uh, it was it was really nice to sit down, and listen to it again, and then listen to it two, three more times to really help me get my own thoughts together about it. So, thank you um, for producing a, a good piece. It was really nice. Well, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm really fortunate, and the fact that uh, we were able to have so many different pieces. Uh, whether it be uh, me, Tanya, and Jerry, or uh, the intersection with Bob, or all the people that uh, that were on the album uh, along with us that were just so special and, and contributed so perfectly uh, with their instruments to the production of this whole thing, uh, the fact that we were able to perform it uh, for you know five years before Jerry had to move to Florida. Um, so you know there are a lot of things that came together on this album, but. At the end of the day, uh, there are good songs on there. And that, that, you know, that's kind of what, you know, like the concert we had at Steel Pier. Uh, those people came together for one time and one time only. But there was something, uh, something really good that kind of pulled us together. And I think the songs uh, were part of what pulled us together. Uh, and so because they're, they're fun to play on, uh, they're good, they've been, they've been proven over time to be enjoyed by audiences. And... Um, yeah, it, it was a, it was a landmark production for for me in terms of kicking the can down the road a little bit as far as performance, but also in terms of engineering and uh, and just performance. Uh, I've always been proud of it. Always will. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's been another episode of the Path Taken. Um, a good one, very good one, if I can say so myself. I have appreciated this particular moment going through this entire record. Um, 
And I, I appreciate you doing it, man. I do. Oh, you're welcome. It's been my pleasure. My pleasure. So this is Alton Riddick on behalf of Tom Farley. I'm going to sign out for another episode. See you next time. This episode was produced by Tom Farley and Alton Riddick, edited and mixed by Alton Riddick for Edit Your Truth. On behalf of Tom, this is Alton signing off until we meet again on The Path Taken.